When I was 13 years old, I went to a haunted house. And um, this haunted house that I went to, those of you that are older and you've lived around this area for any length of time, it was right off of Centerville and Duck Creek, and it just said Spook House out front. Well, me and a few of my buddies on our club soccer team had just got new sweatsuits. These things were sweet, man. They, had a, they were hooded sweatshirts with a big logo, and then they had, they were blue pants, they had the logo on the pant. These things were sweet. Uh, my parents had to pay for them. It was like probably 130 bucks. I don't know. Uh, but man, we were proud. And so being, being 13 years old, we put these things on, and um, one parent took us, and we, we went out to eat, and we went to this haunted house, and man, we just thought we were so cool in our new sweet-looking sweatsuits. So we're kind of showing them off and like, hey, look at us. Went to this haunted house and we got our tickets and we got in line and finally got to go. And we go in and the way the haunted house was set up, each little stage of the haunted house was a different scene. So you would walk into this one area and it was a scene that had a railing here and the scene would take place on the other side of the railing. But when you walked in, it was dark and either it was completely black on the scene or it was very dimly lit. And I'm, we're standing there, and, and the first one, the lights kind of lift up, and there's a, a coffin with um, what looks to be a dead person in it. Well, come to find out it was a vampire, and the vampire pops out, and he kind of comes to the railing. And, you know, I handled it well. I was like, you know, I'm 13, I'm a man. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and so I, you know, I just played it off, acted like I wasn't scared. And uh, we went to the next one, and it was a werewolf scene in a, in a jail. And, played that off, and we went to another one, and it was like a Freddy Krueger scene, and I, I played that off, and, and inside I'm, I'm starting to kind of freak out. And each stage is getting scarier and scarier, and I'm playing it off like I'm not scared, but I, I by the time we get to the last stage, I am freaking out. They have this one area where you have to get down and crawl in a crawl space, and so you're like in this little box square, and you're crawling through, and there's holes where, where people would stick their hands out and grab your leg and stuff as you're walking through. So, needless to say, I tickled in my pants a little bit. I'm, I am freaking out. I am, we get to the last scene, and it's like a, I, I can't even remember if, it was just this jacked up dude, I don't know if he was dressed up like a chainsaw master guy or not, but he had a chainsaw, and it's pitch black, and they make you get right up to the railing. So here's the railing, and the, the leader, the, the people that are guiding you, push you up. So you're right up on the railing. And you know the scene's right here. And somehow, out of this group of 30 people, I ended up in the back. So I'm at the end, and they're all, so wherever we're escaping out of, I'm the last one who's going to get a chance to get out. So I'm standing here. The railing's right here, and the lights come up, and this jacked up dude with like zippers on his face, and oh, it was nasty, with a chainsaw is standing this close to me. And he's just like, nah! and the chainsaw's going, and I freak, y'all. I mean, I'm like, ah! I freak. I turn, everybody else is gone. The lights came up, and they left. Well, I am like frozen, screaming. Finally, I come to my senses, I turn, I see the exit door, and I mean, and I sprint. This dude jumps over the railing and is chasing me through the corridor out to where the, the, the exit door is. I don't know it's an exit door, I just know it's a door to someplace else where this dude is not. So I, mean, I am screaming, booking it, running it, ah! booking it, through the door, fall onto gravel, scream my hands all up, rip my pants, my brand new sweats, rip them at the knees, cut my knees all up, but I was outside and it was over and I could care less. The only, the only emotion or sense that was going through my body that I cared about at all was relief. Because I was no longer in that place. I am now outside. I am safe. I'm like picking up the bloody rocks that I scrape myself on. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. I'm not in there anymore with that lunatic. I am so thankful. And then one of my buddies says, let's do it again. <laughs> no! I'm not doing it again. Do you see my knees? Do, do you see that I almost wet myself? I'm not going back in there. Well, they went back in. I didn't want to do it. I sat outside by myself while they went in. 
I could care less. I was not going back in. The, the sense of relief that I had to know that I was out of that situation was huge. And the freak out that started in me when my buddy said, let's go back in. And then the relief I had, not only being outside, but then the relief I had to know, no, I'm not doing it again. Forget about it. Like double relief, you know what I mean? It's relief to know that, that I'm out of this situation and relief to know that I don't have to go back into it. Have you ever been in a situation where you were so relieved that it was over? Like, I mean, it was this, this tent. It may have been a scary situation. It may have been a tense situation. It may have been a heartbreaking situation. But has there ever been a time where you were scared or tense or broken or stressed? And once it was over, there was just this, this sense of relief that I'm out of that situation and it's over. Can you imagine? For, think with me. Can you imagine the relief of Noah and his family when they finally put their feet on dry ground? The relief, the sense of it's over and we're out. It's over, it's done, and we're out. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 8. I need you to pay really close attention for the next 20 minutes. I'm not going to read all of it for the sake of time because we're... You'll notice I'm skipping the first seven verses of chapter 9. That's on purpose. I'm coming back to it next week. All right? Um, I will come back to that next week. But this week I want us to discuss um, these two words. Never again. Never again. My first point tonight... It's called the reason for the covenant. So if you're taking notes, and I hope you are. The reason for the covenant. Noah gets off the boat, and as a manifestation of his relief and gratitude, he immediately sacrifices to God. Look at verse 20 of chapter 8. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered it as a burnt offering to the Lord. Now, if you remember, Noah took two by two on the ark, right? But there were some animals that he took seven of. And the reason why they were taken was because God um, wanted them to have them as a means of sacrifice after. And that's exactly what Noah does. Noah steps out and the first thing Noah does a manifestation of how relieved he is that the flood is over, the waters are gone, I'm back on dry ground, it's all over, I'm out of the ark, is that he builds an altar to the Lord and he sacrifices these symbolic, uh, clean animals to God. The Bible says this is pleasing to the Lord. Look at verse 21. And the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. Now, let me ask you a question. Does God, not, now, not, not the second person of the Trinity, we know the second of the person of the Trinity eventually became a human being, right? Alright? But at this point, does God have a nose? No, He does not. God is a spirit with no nose. So when it says that God smelled the aroma, don't think about an old man in heaven going... <laughs> but I'm telling you, people think that somehow God is an old man up in heaven... Looking like us, God is a spirit. So the reason why this language is used by God is to express to us that the offering was indeed a pleasing thing to God. It was a pleasing thing to God. And God loved the fact that Noah and his family were worshiping him. Now, isn't that what we should do? When God does something for us, we should then worship in gratitude toward him. Well, again, imagine the relief. God saved us, God protected us, God graced us in the ark, and now we're out, and so we want to worship God for what He's done for us. Now, I cannot help but think about this. I cannot help but think He was super relieved, but at the same time, He's probably a little worried. And you say, well, why in the world would Noah be worried? 
Here's what I think. I think Noah knows man's going to end up bad again. And then we, are we going to have to go through this all over again? No. Like, after, after more men are, are, and human beings populate the earth again, are, are, are we going to go through the same thing where, where wickedness rules and reigns and, and people are sinful and people are wicked and God says, that's it, I've had enough, I'm going to flood again? So there's this sense, like just like me, when I came out of the haunted house and I was super relieved, I'm like, oh, and then my friend says, let's do it again. Then I was like, what? What? I can't help but think there's, that there's kind of this relief and then this worry again where it's like, oh no, are we going to have to go through something like this again at some point? Now here, listen. It is absolutely true. It is absolutely true that human beings will end up the exact same way they were before the flood. Look at me. It is absolutely true that human beings will end up acting the exact same way they did before the flood. That is a fact. No one knows it, and God knows it. God knows human beings at heart are wicked and sinful. They're not good, they're wicked and sinful. So, God moves to alert Noah that Noah, you don't have to worry. You're not going to have to go through something like this again. <sighs> Relief again, right? I'm relieved. I'm off the boat. Oh, no. We're going to go through something like this again? No, we're not. And here's the reason why God makes the promise. Now, we know what the promise is, right? We're all pretty familiar with the story of Noah. What does God promise? I'm never again going to destroy humanity and creatures with the flood. It's not going to happen. All of humanity will, will never be destroyed again by a flood. But here's the reason. Look at this. Look at verse 21. I will never again curse the ground because of man. Listen to this. Listen. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. What is God saying? God's saying, I'm going to have to make a promise not to do this again because if I don't promise to do this again, I'm going to have to do it over and over and over again because the heart of man never changes. Remember what happens before the flood? Every intention of man's heart was wicked continuously. Now what does God say after the flood? The intentions of man's heart is wicked from his youth. Guess what God knows? God knows man's heart is wicked. And so if God doesn't promise never to do this again, God's going to do it again over and over and over and over and over again because man's always going to be back in the same kind of position. Now, there's this idea out there. Look at me. There's this idea out there among human beings that, that people are basically good. Right? People are basically good. For instance, let me give you an example of this. Uh, we had Hurricane Harvey. Right? We had Hurricane uh, was it Irma in, in Florida. And, I'll, I, and I cannot tell you how many times on social media and on news networks. Listen, do I think we are made in the image of God? Yes. Do I think that, that human beings know that sacrifice is a good thing? Yes. Am I glad that people sacrifice to protect and to serve and to help people out in those situations? Yes. But I cannot tell you how many times I've heard this. This is what humanity is all about. This is who we really are. And I'm thinking, wait, so, so what they're basically saying is, we're really good. We're really good. We're not, we're not really bad. We're really good. Now, that's a good thing what they did. But are those people that sacrificed themselves, are they not sinners too? Of course they are. Of course they're sinners. See, God knows that from our youth, we are wicked and sinful. So God makes a promise. So the reason for the promise is that God knows man's never going to change. So if I just keep doing this, if I'm going to base flooding the earth on whether or not man is good, I'm going to have to do this over and over and over again. So he promises never again. Number two, the nature of the covenant. So what is the covenant? Okay, what is it? What does God say? What's the covenant? I will never again 
flood the world, destroy man with a flood. Okay? That is the promise or that is the covenant. Now I want to discuss the nature of the covenant. There's some important things here. Number one, it is based on grace. Take notes. It's number one. It is based on grace. What is grace? Some of you aren't listening. Grace is getting something you don't deserve. It's getting something you don't deserve. Some people said, well, the reason why God made this covenant was because Noah made a sacrifice. False. God didn't make the covenant because Noah made a sacrifice. God, listen, God's not down there going, ooh, the entrails of animals burning. Now I won't kill you. All right, how absurd, John Calvin, one of the greatest theologians ever, he says, how absurd, or nothing can be more absurd than to suppose that God should have been appeased by, the, by filthy smoke of entrails and flesh. That's, that's not why God, God went, ooh, entrails and flesh? Now I won't destroy the world again. That's not the reason why. The reason why is because God is gracious. God is going to, to give man something he does not deserve. Life. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But yet God is going to let man live upon the earth without destroying them over and over and over. Notice who's doing all the talking in this. God says, I will never again curse the ground for every, for, for the, uh, because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Ne neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, sea time, harvest, cold, heat, summer, winter, day, night, shall not cease. Then God said to Noah, and then God said in verse 12, God says, God says, God says. Guess what Noah's doing the whole time God is talking? He's not talking. He's sitting there and he's listening because this covenant is based on God's initiation, all right, his initiative to man. God is always the initiator. We are the responder. God does not respond. He initiates. So God, in his grace, has determined, because I am gracious, I'm not going to wipe you guys out the flood again. So this covenant is based on God's grace. Number two. It's unilateral. What? What does that mean? Unilateral. Write it down. It is unilateral. Well, here's what unilateral means. Listen carefully. You get an English lesson as well, guys. This serve a lot of purposes here. Here's what unilateral means. An action being performed by one person toward another. In other words, it's not you doing an action for me and me doing an action for you. It's me doing an action toward you. Unilateral. It's one way. Okay? It's a one way covenant. God is saying, here's what I am going to do. In other words, the covenant that God makes, he will never break. Do you know the difference between a contract and a covenant? Listen, you know the difference between a contract and a covenant? A contract says this. I'm going to provide these services, and you're going to pay me this amount. Right? So let's say I come to Kylie, and I'm like, Kylie, listen, I want you to come to my house, and I want you to mow my grass. And Kylie, I'm going to give you $50 for you to mow my grass. And Kylie comes to my house, she mows for about 10 minutes, and then she quits. And next thing I know, she left. And then she calls me the phone and says, hey, where's my 50 bucks? A contract will say, no, 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 no. You hold up your end of the contract, I'll hold up my end of the contract. But if you bail on your end of the contract, guess what I don't have to do? I ain't got to pay you 50 bucks. Okay, that's a contract. You know what a covenant says? A covenant says, listen, a covenant says, I... I'm going to do something for you whether you do anything back for me or not. That's a covenant. I'm going to do this for you. When God makes a covenant with man, I'm going to do this for you whether you do it for me or not. So this covenant to never flood the earth again, 
Is it dependent upon man? Does man have to do anything for God to keep his side of the covenant? Yes or no? No. God is going to keep his side of the covenant no matter what. Now, last one. It is all-encompassing. All-encompassing me is referring to people and time. All right? I want you to look at verse 9 of chapter 9. God, uh, verse 8, God says to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. So who is the covenant made to? Who is the covenant made to? Just Noah? Just Noah and his sons. Every human being after them. God made a covenant with you before you ever existed not to ever destroy mankind by a flood. You are a part of that covenant. God has made that covenant with you. But it also refers to eternity or time. Now, I'm not talking about eternity past. I'm talking about from this point forward. All right? So as soon as God made the covenant, as long as earth exists, that's what God says, as long as earth exists, I will never again flood the earth and destroy man. Now I want to end with this last point. The sign of the covenant. So we have the reason for the covenant. We have the nature for the covenant. The nature of the covenant is that it is a grace. It is unilateral. It is all-encompassing. And lastly, the sign of the covenant. Often, when people make covenants, they give a sign to the person they're making a covenant with that is uh, a symbol of the covenant. Now look right up here. You see what this way I got in my hand right here? What is this? Ring. Not just any ring. Wedding wedding. Wedding. This is a wedding ring. Don't make your the day, listen to me, the day that Jessica and I got married, June 16th, 2001, over 16 years ago, she put this on my finger as a symbol of the covenant she was making to me. She was promising me on that day. She looked me in the face and said, I promise to be to you in all things, Neil. I give you my love. I give you my faithfulness. I give you everything I am. I, I am yours. And as a symbol of this covenant I'm making with you, till death do us part, here's this ring. And I'm placing it on your finger so that every time you look at it, You'll be reminded of the covenant I'm making with you today. Of course, I did the same thing to her. Mine was a little bit more expensive, but, you know, leave that as it is. So God here makes a covenant. And you know what his covenant is? The rainbow. The rainbow. The rainbow. Look, look at verses 12 and 13 of chapter 9. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I will make between you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the rainbow didn't exist before the flood. Okay? Human beings may have seen a rainbow before the flood. What this means is that God is marking that, that rainbow, right? that piece of nature. God is marking that with a promise. Let me ask you a question. Did this metal, this is white gold, okay? Did this metal exist before it was fashioned into a ring and put on my finger? Yes. yes. All right? It existed before that. But the day that it was fashioned into a ring and put on my finger, it was marked with a promise. Right? Yes. It got its special symbolic meaning once my wife promised me. The rainbow might have been around before this, but the point is, is that God now marks the rainbow as a promise. So every time human beings see a rainbow up in the sky, do you know what God is publicly saying? I made a covenant with you guys. Many of you do not even believe I exist. Many of you do not worship me. Nevertheless, I keep my covenant with you. I keep my promise to you. Now, guys, I'm going to focus right here and look at me. Put everything out of your hands and look at me. God made another covenant with human beings 
God has made multiple covenants with human beings. But God made another covenant with human beings. We call it the new covenant. All right? Or we call it the covenant of grace. Jesus Christ came to earth. God made flesh. Came to earth. Lived a sinless life on behalf of sinners. You can't live a sinless life, so Jesus did it for you. Lived a sinless life on behalf of sinners. Went to the cross and died on behalf of sinners. Was raised to life on behalf of sinners. And now sits at the right hand of the Father. He ascended into heaven and now sits at the right hand of the Father in glory, in heaven, this very moment. And everyone who has ever been saved by Jesus has been saved by grace. That too is a unilateral covenant. And here's why. If I can lose, I, I got saved at the age of 14. If I can lose my salvation, guess what? I would have done it. You know how many times that Neil Salen in and of myself would have walked away from God? Would have abandoned God? Would have quit on God? Would have looked God in the face and said, forget it, I want my own way, I'm going to do my own thing. But guess what God would not do? He would not break His covenant with me. He would not let me go. And He brings me back time after time after time. And the Bible says that at the end, I will be saved and nothing can stop me. I can't even stop it myself. Remember our, remember our you can't stop me? You can't? Even I can't stop me. Nothing can stop God's salvation for me. Why? Because God made a covenant with me. Now check this out. Check this out. Did God make a, sim, a sign or a symbol of the covenant? This new covenant, this covenant of grace that Jesus made with human beings. Did God make, did, did, was there a sign or a symbol? Think about it. Is there a sign or a symbol of the covenant of salvation that God has made of His people? Now let me ask you a question. I don't think it's the cross. Let me tell you why. I think cross is a good symbol. But I don't think it's, it's God's symbol. Where, where would God the Father look to see the symbol? What would make the only thing that would make sense if God the Father is going to look anywhere at anybody or anything to think about the covenant He has made with human beings? Where is He going to look? Jesus. He's going to look at Jesus. That's the only place He can look, right? He's going to look at Jesus. Jesus is going to look at Himself. Jesus is the one who did it. All right. Now the cross is where He died, but the cross didn't do it. Jesus did it. Now check this out. It's so cool, guys. It's so. Cool. Jesus was punched in the face. No doubt was split wide open. His beard was ripped right off of his face. All right? Did you think about how bad it hurts when someone grabs your hair and just pulls it? Your face is way more sensitive than your head is. Imagine someone walking up and, and, and a man has a beard and grabbing chunks of that beard and ripping it out. They took a... a they took thorns and they fashioned, and we're talking massive thorns. This, you know, sometimes I see these little thorns like this, probably big thorns. And they jammed it into his head. They took a whip made of nine pieces of leather with rock and glass all wrapped up in the leather. And they whipped him 39 times on his back with it. The Bible says that Jesus was unrecognizable as a human being. That's how bad he was beaten. Yet after he died and rose from the dead, were there any scars left on his face? No. Were there any scars left on his back? No. Were there any scars left on his head? Were there any scars left on his hands? Yes. Remember when Jesus showed up to doubting Thomas? And he says, Thomas, come. Touch my hands. Touch my side. Now, now, stop and think with me for a minute. Why leave those scars there? It's a symbol. It's a sign. Listen, the body of Jesus carries a permanent sign upon it of the covenant He has made with you, Christian. Every 
single moment that goes by, Jesus Christ has a permanent flesh symbol or mark on his body to represent what he did for you. And he did it by grace. It was unilateral. You didn't do anything to get it. He gave it to you. You didn't do anything to earn it. He earned it for you. Now, there's a big difference, though, between the covenant of Noah and the covenant of Jesus. The covenant of Noah, check this out. The covenant of Noah, all people for all time, right? Because all of us are children of Noah. We are all in Noah's family, true? We all came from Noah. Let me ask you this question. Have all of us come from Jesus? No. The Bible says to be a Christian is to be in Christ. To be from the line of of Jesus. You say, well, how does that happen? How does a person who's not in the line of Jesus become in the line of Jesus? It's very simple. You repent and you turn from your sin and you trust in Jesus Christ. You turn from being the God of your own life and doing things your way and doing what you want to do and you repent and you become a follower of Jesus. At the age of 14, look at me. At the age of 14, the Holy Spirit moved in my life changed my heart and I no longer wanted to live for me. Do you know where living for you gets you? Destroyed. Living for you gets you destroyed. And, and to, I could prove this very easily because I could just go get people who could line up on this stage and say, before I became a Christian I lived for myself and I was a drug addict. Make it walk off. The next person come and said, before I became a Christian, I was living for myself. And I was an active homosexual. And they would walk off. The next person come and said, before I met Jesus, I lived for myself and I was a thief. We, we could just go on and on forever. And that the path of living for yourself ends in you destroying yourself. But when you repent of that and you turn from living for yourself and you start following Jesus to live for him, it's eternal life. It's life everlasting and life abundant. So, so here's the thing. The covenant of Noah, everybody gets it. Everybody gets it because we're all from Noah. But not everybody gets the covenant of Jesus because we're not, not everybody is a Jesus. Not everybody is in the family of God. But if you will repent tonight and you will turn from your sin and live in for yourself and you follow Jesus, you will be saved and you will be changed and your life will forever. God will have you forever and he will never lose you.